for having me, first of all. Uh, thank you for the very kind invitation. Thank you, Cem. Thank you to the whole group. Uh, and uh, I thought that I would use this hour uh, to talk a little bit about uh, uh, this uh, um, paper that tries to put together several studies that we did, some are our original uh, published work and some in which we replicated uh, the work of others to get an idea of the impact of uh, uh, different policies to integrate refugees uh, in labor markets. Uh, and I have to acknowledge this has been a work of many years together with several uh, Danish co-author and in this particular overview paper, Mette Foge and Linnaeus Asseger are the two co-authors. Okay, we can go with the first slide. All right, so essentially uh, I will try to give you an idea of uh, uh, the impact of four different type of policies that I will argue encompass essentially all of the policies that we deploy as Western countries to integrate refugees. So already you should think of this as a paper about integration of refugees in developed countries, in rich countries, of which we will take Denmark as a very interesting example. Um, um, the way in which we approach this is we want to say something about the effect, the average effect of these policies. And we want to try to have a clean identification strategy so that what we identify is a causal effect of the policy on the outcomes, in particular on employment and earnings of, migra of refugees. But as you will see, I will also expand this outcome into other family outcome, children outcome uh, for some of these policies. Um, uh, and then we want to also do a little bit of uh, uh, an heterogeneity analysis, which means a little bit how this policy works for a few for different groups. When I've given you an overview of these four policies, which correspond to four different papers in which we analyzed those, but I will try to summarize them, I will dig into what policies come out to be uh, more effective. Uh, and uh, uh, in particular, uh, we will uh, uh, spend some time in this uh, um, settlement policy and language training policies. And I will go more into what we think are the mechanisms through which this policy works, how their effect evolve over time in the dynamics and what are possibly other effects of this policy, not just the labor market uh, effects. Next. Um, so let me just as a motivation, um, and uh, I um, uh, normally when I give this talk, there are people who are very interested in uh, immigration and refugees, but this group is a group the, which is also interested in uh, local economy, urban economy, uh, uh, regional economy. So uh, let me give the motivation and expand them a little bit. So first of all, why did we why do I focus on refugees today? Uh, you shouldn't think of this as a study of integration of immigrants in general. Refugees are this particular group. You can argue that are among the most vulnerable migrant when they arrive because they come from a situation of danger of war. Um, uh, but also there is this sense that many of them have incredible economic potential. So if we deploy the right policy at the right time, maybe the dividend of this policy is even bigger for refugees than for other groups. Um, um, so given that I'm giving this talk at the distance, I don't even have a clicker. I will never click on all those links that you see there. But if you are interested, I'm going to tell you about them. Um, and uh, um, one problem that European countries in particular have with refugees is that their labor market integration is significantly worse than natives, but also than other immigrants. And this has been documented by a lot of uh, paper. One number to have in mind, uh, which will be true for Denmark as well, which is quite representative, why uh, the, refu the average refugees employment rate never goes above 40-50%, while the average employment rate of native of similar similar age uh, is uh, 70 to 80%. So they never catch up uh, to employment. Um, and uh, so figuring out which policies work and maybe why and maybe when is going to be particularly important for this group. Um, we focus on policy ev evaluation because while there is a lot of descriptive uh, studies talking about the 
um, evolution of integration of refugees and immigrants over time is really hard to find, or there are much fewer that really tell us what about the effect of these policies. And I'm already introducing, telling you what are the four type of policies that we are going to analyze and evaluate. One are active labor market policies, which means helping refugees to find a job and quickly train them for those jobs. Um, welfare benefit policies, so giving them uh, the um, higher or lower amount of initial cash transfer. Normally, typically, this is done in the first two or three years to get them running. So how much uh, uh, impact we'll have to give them more or less uh, money, uh, providing them with language training and uh, placing them in specific locations uh, with some characteristics that we will um, analyze. In Denmark, um, I mean, I guess uh, we were discussing this before, we have a lot of paper on Den papers on Denmark, if you know academics, uh, uh, because Denmark has very good data. But I would argue that uh, in the analysis of the refugee, Denmark is a pretty typical country in, U in, the, in, in Europe, um, uh, because um, it has had a percentage of refugee relative to the population comparable to um, sort of the median to up, comparable to many in Scandinavian countries, uh, a little bit lower than Germany in the recent year, uh, but large. Um, it has tried many different policies, and this makes uh, uh, possible to evaluate uh, their success. And of course, as this is very, very good and very, very detailed data uh, on uh, uh, a lot of outcomes of everybody, including refugees in the last 40 years. And so that's the motivation. Next. So this is a little bit of a graph that I used to uh, introduce and, and explain the life of refugees and to tell you to place the policy that we are uh, discussing and to place the dynamic. So um, if you start at the left uh, end um, uh, uh, where uh, the life of the refugee, think of this as a, a, of a timeline, the refugee is displaced and then typically spends sometimes uh, um, not necessarily in the final destination countries, uh, on average one to two years. Then it, uh, the refugee arrives in the country that will be, become uh, his or her destination. And when the refugee arrives in the country, uh, is still an asylum seeker um, and is placed in a, uh, in a refugee camp. While in the refugee camp, the application as asylum seeker is processed, and this takes between uh, months to one to 1.5 years. And then uh, for the refugee which are allowed, for the asylum seeker which are, who are allowed as refugee, their life in the country starts. So that point uh, at uh, uh, which I, ca I call asylum adjudication in this graph is when we start looking at the outcome of the refugees. Some of these refugees have been in the country for a while before, but they have been in a, a refugee center. So they have had very little contact with the locals. They, in many countries, most countries, they cannot work. They are uh, uh, much, much isolated. Few refugees, the UN resettled one, they can come directly uh, at the asylum adjudication point. And so we start observing them there. Then I split the life of the refugee for after arrival in like three, three segments, short, medium, and long run, which are five years uh, interval. And all the policies that I will analyze are policies which are deployed in the short run, in the first uh, period of the refugee. The placement, which is where the refugee is initially assigned, is really uh, implemented at the time of the asylum assignment. And then this active labor market policy, the cash transfer and the language training are all typically done in the early years. And what we want to do is we want to look at the effect of these policies, both in the short, in the medium and in the long run. In this, this paper, in that we can uh, extend our knowledge of the effect of policy to the long run is a little bit unique. Even other paper that before had analyzed the impact on refugee, very few go beyond five years because the data didn't allow. <laughs> That line, which is <clears throat> purely stylized, wants to give you the idea also, and I will show some real graph 
Think of it as some outcome on the labor market, uh, employment rate or earnings. That wants to give you the idea that a lot of the catch up, a lot of the dynamics happens in the short run. If refugees in the short run don't get employed, don't get to a level of salary, after five years, their position stabilizes. And so it becomes much harder to integrate them and to have a growing uh, employment rate and, uh, um, and uh, uh, earning. So that's a little bit the lifetime on which uh, we will talk, and I will talk about the effect of these policies. Next. Okay. So uh, the contribution of this paper, as I said, or this presentation are that we will look at these uh, four policies and uh, we will look at this longer run impact for many of them. Uh, so even for the paper that we had written or other people had written, we extend the outcome longer. And then we try to find some a dimension of heterogeneity, which matters for all of these policies and for the integration of refugees, for which we can say for all these policies something. And uh, typically, I will sort of, there are many of them, but I will talk about gender, about country of origin, and about initial location of the refugees. And then, given that we find really this interesting and promising effect on language teaching, uh, we are going to zoom and do a little bit more on how we think this language teaching works on impacting their outcome and the outcome of their children. Yes. Okay, um, let's hear, I don't need to tell you, uh, I want to keep uh, things focused uh, on the discussion. The data of Denmark are really good. Uh, and in this paper, we really bring in data on crime, data on education, and data on spouse and children to say something also about family and second generation, uh, which is uh, a little unique. Keep in mind that in the end, um, we don't have a sample which is gigantic. The sample of refugees in which most of this policy evaluation is done is between eight and 9,000 individuals uh, and uh, um, um, about, about 6,000 children. This is because uh, Denmark is not a huge country, but you will see we have enough power to say uh, quite a bit. And we take refugees, most of the result that I will present are for refugee who arrive as adults between 18 and 47. We cut it 47 because we want to follow these people for 18 years. So we want to follow them up to 65. If we start with very old, we're going to follow people who certainly are going to go into retirement. So that's the logic. Okay, next. Okay, so before uh, telling you about the policy, I want to show you a little bit of these simple graphs of the dynamic of the refugees that we're going to talk about. And this equation that I put here is the equation that is used to estimate why would be any outcome, employment rate uh, or earnings. And then uh, people have regressed this outcome on characteristics of the refugee and the location, X and Z. And then on dummies, which are dummies for each year since arrival, YSA. And so the coefficient beta K will track, starting from the arrival, how that outcome, controlling for observable, will vary in year one, two, three, from four, five, from arrival. So if you run this only with refugees, you just have the dynamics and you standardize to zero the first point. You have just the dynamics of refugee. If you run this also with natives and you allow a dummy for refugees, uh, the first dummy will tell you the initial gap, and then the rest will tell you the evolution of the gap. I'm, I'm going to show you just some dynamics to, uh, um, uh, to show uh, how our refugees work. Next. So this is just the average, taking all the refugees over these 40 years, pulling all of them together, controlling for cohort of arrival and a bunch of individual characteristics. On the left, you have the evolution, standardized to zero at the first uh, year, the evolution of their employment rate. And on the right, you have the evolution of their income. Uh, keep in mind that the evolution of the employment rate of income, uh, it's uh, kind of standardized to zero, but they, these people really start with very close to zero because they cannot work uh, when they are are in the pre period So they start with the employment rate, which are very low. Yes. Just a very quick uh, clarification. So um, what kind of uh, sample attrition are we, are, we, are we observing here? So I'm assuming that we don't have the same sample in, in year one as we have in year 15, no? So yeah, that's a great question. Oh, no, no, you don't. Yes, so that's a, a great question. So um, the attrition of this group uh, straight out is not huge, it's around 15%. Because this, uh, a lot of, while a lot of migrant remigrates, these refugees uh, sort of have lost the connection with their country of origin, almost no one of them return. And as you will see, uh, most of them are not the highly skilled type of people that move around. Um, we, um, the results that I'm going to show you, uh, when we estimate it on the, the long run, is are only on the sample 
hole that is there for the whole period. But then we also estimate some on the varying example. And then we test that attrition out of our, this 15% attrition is not correlated with a bunch of characteristics. So in summary, the attrition is there, is not huge, probably much smaller than for other groups. And it doesn't seem to be uh, systematically correlated with the policies that we studied, which would be um, kind of uh, dangerous. So in this graph that you see, can you see that- Can I also ask another clarifying question for you, Mo? Yes. <laughs> Did maybe he unmuted himself, or maybe you raised the hand. I don't know. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, yes, question. Uh, I was muted. Sorry. Uh, this this sample that you have, the, the it is the entire stock of the refugees at a given time, right? They have arrived in different times. And, and as a follow-up to that, will your study tell us something about the, like the, uh, the, the stock of the um, uh, refugees? If, they, uh, if the influx is huge, right? Will the policies work at the same extent if they are arriving in, at a slower pace? Right? Uh, yes. So. Uh... I will say, so we clearly we evaluate policies which have been chosen in particular years, some of them in some variation. And uh, um, I will uh, uh, try to argue that, uh, uh, and, and there will be a varying flow of refugees, uh, certainly. Uh, the identification of the policy, uh, it's really uh, sort of independent from the number of refugees that came in the year. Um, you're asking if this effect would have been different if the policy would have been adopted in a different year and possibly. Um, um, uh, let, let me describe some of these things and some of these uh, uh, policies and then let's think a second about what could be uh, different. I guess you have in mind that when many refugees come, uh, there are some constraints, some space constraint or some competition type of effect which are different. And I will talk about that uh, quite a bit, uh, talking about the spatial distribution because uh, um, also uh, you know the timing depends also on which location uh, and the location. Uh, where they are. So uh, let me keep this in mind and then let's see uh, okay. uh, how the, uh, the, the, this could affect the, the, the effectiveness of policies. Um, so let me just here, I, I'm still a little bit descriptive. So uh, I just want to show with this um, that over their 15 years of stay, refugee increased their percentage uh, of uh, employment probability by 40 percentage point. But most of the gain happens in the first five to six years. And they increase their real income, their real earnings, sorry, real wage earning by about $20,000 in 2015 PPP. Um, uh, and again, a large part of this increase happens in the first uh, five to six uh, years. Next. Of course, that um, if, you, if you compare them to natives, though, some of that growth is just a natural experience premium, the fact that when people age earn more, and so this gain becomes much less. And in terms of income, they almost don't catch up at all with natives. They just have a similar natural growth in terms of employment, they catch up, um, but uh, less, they catch up about 30 percentage points. And I will give at the end a couple of numbers to keep in mind. This, uh, next, this uh, just pulls all the refugees together. Here I split by cohort of arrival. And you notice, and again, it's a little uh, hard to see, but the earlier cohort um, uh, seem to have integrated a little bit better. They are higher. The earlier cohort are sort of those little triangles uh, and, uh, um, and the little squares, uh, the uh, empty uh, and diamond sort of at the top, than the later cohorts. And this is mainly due to the different composition of these cohorts. Next, one big factor that differentiate the integration is clearly the country of origin. And one stylized fact that comes out of this is that the refugees that were admitted from Europe and Asia, and uh, the two a big episode. Europe has been the Bosnian, the ex-Yugoslavian essentially crisis that, that is one that brought a lot of refugees. And Asia 
is a little bit of a mix of uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, uh, probably uh, highly represented uh, in a few other countries, integrated much strongly, uh, um, or the dynamic of their employment and wages is much uh, um, faster than refugees from Africa and the Middle East. Uh, and the Middle East, a lot are Afghani and Iraqi. Uh, in Africa, uh, there are uh, a lot of the um, East African, some uh, uh, from Central Africa um, uh, refugees. So, uh, country of origin uh, matters a lot, so much so that the different waves integrated a different level, likely because they had different percentage of these groups. Next, and then gender matters as well. In women uh, tend to have a slower uh, integration, uh, probably uh, even more a bigger gap in wages than in, in employment rate. Um, uh, and again, it's a uh, set of factors uh, that uh, will affect these different uh, uh, these different dynamics. Can I so, ask? Sorry. Yes, questions. Um, yeah. So this gender difference um, is there? Are you controlling also for occupation and regular gender differences between on earnings? No, I'm not. Um, not not for occupation. I'm just controlling for the all the demographics uh, that are in there. So uh, these differences can definitely be uh, driven by uh, differential occupation. I mean, in a sense, uh, I always consider occupation as one of the channels through which these uh, differences happen, sort of in 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 endogenous variables. So if you were to plot what type of occupation um, women are and what type of occupation men are in terms of uh, cognitive intensity and manual intensity, you will find also a difference. Mm -hmm. And and in couple families, do you observe that the females um, uh, uh, integrate better for those males who integrate better? Uh, so most of the, so the overwhelming majority of these refugees uh, are couples. Uh, if there is a, a man and a woman, very often the woman uh, joined a little later. So um, uh, do I, if I do it by single or by couple, uh, is there a bigger integration? And I don't have uh, the answer on top of my uh, head here. I'm trying to, we did a lot of this uh, um, kind of uh, heterogeneity on, on descriptives. Um, uh, I cannot tell you uh, uh, right now if uh, if uh, uh, married women integrate uh, uh, faster uh, than unmarried me women. I'll, I'll I'll think about it, uh, uh, but it's a good question. Yep. No, now it's working. And any um, did you get a chance to look into the importance of local factors or business cycle, the year of entry, and. Um, yeah, so the, uh, there will be one full thing focused on how strong is the labor market at arrival as a determinant of how well these people integrate. And the answer is that uh, the strength of labor market in the location at arrival is a very is one of the few things that really matter for their integration. If you arrive in a place where the employment rate or the employment rate of immigrant is higher by one standard deviation, you are going to have a higher employment rate in the short and in the long run and a higher income in the short and in the long run. So local condition in terms of labor market strength seem to matter quite a bit, actually, at entry. Yep. Another quick question just on the differences between people from different uh, countries of origin. Uh, do you observe in the data if people um, got their degrees in, in Denmark or if they only got degrees from abroad that would potentially not be uh, acknowledged in, the, in, in Denmark? So oh, sorry, we, sorry. we observe uh, uh, the uh, of the characteristics so at arrival. We do observe uh, a, some rough um, um, classification in level of education. Uh, in particular, we know uh, we, we separate we can separate the college educated from the people with some secondary and the people with low to no schooling. And uh, we. Uh, do some of this analysis uh, separately by a uh, group. Uh, most of these policies that we analyze uh, really were deployed for non-college educated refugees or were particularly effective. The college educated they had access uh, to sort of a set 
threat of other um, you know, potential. So you should think of this, I think, as policy for people with the middle to relatively low education. Uh, and uh, um, the question, if some of them upgraded their education when they arrived in the country of destination, and the answer is yes, several of them did. Uh, and we're going to look at for some policy, if the policy itself promoted or encouraged these people to get higher education in the country of destination. Okay, uh, we can move to the next. So uh, these are a couple. So keep in mind, uh, essentially, that uh, uh, the, if the refugees start from with this average very large gap on employment, they start almost at zero employment, and uh, uh, the average native has a 75 uh, percent employment rate. So they start at a gap of 75 percentage point in employment and 40,000 earning, and they catch up, but uh, they in a limited way. Um, maybe they catch up to. A, up to 30 percentage point in employment and a couple of thousand dollars in income. Uh, and most of this is achieved in the first five, six years. And the most of, um, disadvantaged group in this very simple uh, grouping that I did seem to be a refugee from Africa and the Middle East and women refugees. So that's uh, uh, what we will uh, um, comment in particular. Okay, um, next. Okay, yes, I have, yes, question. Do you have any data on remittances? they do to their countries sending money abroad or if they receive money probably they're sending abroad i'm just thinking you know if the entrepreneurs and you know take advantage of the uh, so we don't have data on remittances because we don't have data on on their money expenditure. All the data we have are on labor market, education, uh, and things which are recorded in uh, the, i uh, yeah, I don't know that there is, uh, I, I'm trying to dig in my mind uh, of what is the literature about remittances of refugees in particular. And, uh, you know, they're a particular group. I think they will fear sending remittances in part uh, because their family can be in danger and because their country can interject. On the other hand, they may have. So as a consequence, not only we have poor data on remittances in general, my view is that we have terrible data on, but maybe we can do better than that. Um, at the individual level for refugees, maybe even less. So let me make a little progress here because uh, uh, I want to um, uh, tell you everything in half an hour. Uh, and so let me uh, just uh, uh, postpone uh, uh, a couple of questions. So uh, I already told you that the four um, uh, policies that we will evaluate uh, are one active labor market policy, which uh, I will describe in a second, uh, one cut in welfare transfer, uh, one language training improvement, and then a initial random assignment of these refugees across uh, counties and local labor market, uh, which was in place. And those are the dates in which these policies were essentially uh, deployed. Next. So um, let me describe briefly, I don't want to be too much on method, but what method we use for each, for to identify each one of them, and a little bit more on the policy. So the matching and training policy is this very interesting policy, which was rolled out across different municipalities of uh, Denmark between 2013 and 18, in which the employers, potential employers, were asked, what are the jobs in which you have hard time hiring, which are essentially in shortages? And if the refugee would accept to take a job in these uh, shortages occupation, they would give the refugee a quick training, three to four months, and then match the refugee with this uh, job. And uh, what we do is uh, we estimate the effect. Um, uh, so T is the time of arrival of the refugee. We uh, estimate the effect on employment or earning S year after S uh, P the S years after arrival of being arrived in the municipality M before or after this municipality introduced this training scheme. And uh, that dummy, which has KMM large or equal minus six, means that the if the refugees arrive six months before or less than that, um, he can access this uh, policy. So it can be trained uh, within the first year and matched. And if he arrives before that, he cannot use by the time he has been one year in the labor market. And we evaluate the impact of this policy on the one year, that's the only thing we can do for this, one year employment rate uh, for people who entered when this policy was inactive compared to people that enter with the policy was active. Given that is a staggered diff in diff, we use this more recent method developed to take care of bias. And so uh, what you will see is the Callaway and Santana um, estimator on this. 
that's the policy on uh, yeah yeah good good uh, that was the policy on uh, uh, labor market the policy on welfare cut and the next policy on language are based on a regression discontinuity because this reform were introduced for refugee with a very specific date of arrival in particular these welfare cuts in 2002 cut by about 50 percent the welfare which was given in the first two years to refugees who had arrived after July 1st, 2022, uh, relative to the one arrived before. So if you take the months around July 1st, 2022, you have almost uh, similar, and uh, again, we'll do many balanced tests, all very similar refugee who arrives a few days before and they can access uh, this uh, 6,000 extra dollar or a few days after and they cannot access this. And so in that equation, the tau on the discontinuity uh, on uh, 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 dummy will be the effect of this uh, policy. The next, which is a language, is a language training policy, which was introduced instead with uh, the cutoff date of being arrived before or after January 1st, 1999. And you should think of this policy as 400 extra hours of language training in the first three years. Already, the people, uh, there was uh, this uh, uh, policy which was uh, providing uh, uh, language training to refugee uh, of uh, about 1,300 to 1,400 hours. This increases by 30% uh, that. And again, the same regression discontinuity. Um, we spend a lot of time in the paper because this policy was introduced with other small variation to make sure that really is the language that drives uh, the effect. Um, and uh, we can definitely talk much more about some of this when I talk about the effect and when I talk about some characteristics. And then the last type of policy that we evaluate is uh, the fact that uh, between 86 and 98, uh, the refugees of Denmark were assigned to their initial location based on a resettlement agent who only knew very little information. We, uh, the person knew just the nationality of this refugee and the family structure. So conditional on these two characteristics, this distribution of refugee was, should have been completely uh, orthogonal to the characteristics of the refugees. And so what we do is after we control for these individual characteristics that the resettlement agent, agent could see in X, we just regress the outcome S year after uh, arrival on the employment rate and on the share of conational in the initial municipality of arrival. And the employment rate captures a little bit the tightness and the level of the labor market. And the share of conationals uh, capture how big is the network of conationals, uh, which has been subject to a lot of um, kind of uh, uh, debate. Is it good or bad to be placed near uh, conationals? Okay, so um, for these four policies, uh, the first part of the paper shows a little bit the validity of the identification, and I will say a couple of words, and then uh, we're going to go into the results. So next. So uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, active labor market policy uh, in, is an event study, as you see here, and uh, the policy was introduced uh, at, uh, uh, with partial treatment. People who arrived after the dotted line could only partially access. So in the first year of stay, they could access for less than one year to the policy. And after the solid line, they were fully treated. So there was this little transition. But so the pre-trend with some up and downs uh, um, shows that there was not a systematic uh, um, uh, upward or downward trend in the employment rate of refugee arrived in court uh, before the policy. And then after the policy, uh, there seems to be a, a permanent effect or, or a persistent effect of about 5% extra uh, a point uh, in terms of uh, uh, employment rate. And I will talk about that, but this is to give you an idea that uh, the pre-trend uh, and uh, in this and other outcome, um, although not perfect, seems to be reasonably uh, good. And then the next table is going to show the balance of characteristics around the discontinuity for the welfare benefit and the language training. And as you see, all, uh, these are all characteristics of refugee that looks very similar a, a, around the discontinuity. It's not that they are younger, it's not that they have more children, it's not that they come more from Africa, it's not that they have different level of education, more or less they are similar. And so this uh, regression discontinuity put a treatment control differentiation in two groups that seems to be relatively similar, so a relatively random. And then the last two columns show the correlation of uh, the uh, initial employment rate and, sh and, and network measure 
uh, in the uh, municipality of arrival with characteristics of refugees. And this is actually the one where you observe, so you would expect to observe some correlation with the, the number of children, uh, which is something that was observed. You shouldn't observe any correlation with the, the basic education variable uh, um, and with the age variable, but in some uh, you uh, see. And so we'll get back to this. Uh, although, uh, you know, a lot of people have used this random uh, initial assignment, um, you know, if you dig into some of the detail, maybe it was not as random as people uh, think, and we'll keep this in mind uh, when we evaluate this uh, other, these two policies. Okay, so let's go. Uh, I think the next graph summarizes uh, all the results. Next. Yeah, so this is a little bit the summary. Uh, so if you bring home one thing, uh, this is uh, the, the, the thing. Um, there are four policies. The, the green is the active labor market, cutting welfare benefit, increasing language training. And then the last, which is a, a random location, is the effect of being in a high employment rate or in a high share of conational uh, uh, location. So as you see, two or three things emerge very clearly. First, uh, we can only, uh, for the active labor market policy, we can only uh, evaluate this short run because we don't uh, have enough data and the design of the policy make it, makes it a little hard. But there seems to be this uh, significant effect on income, about $2,000 of extra income per year. Um, keep in mind that an average income of the refugee is $12,000. So this is an increase by um, 15 to 20%, which is not small. Um, the, cut of welfare benefit is a cut of $6,000 that clearly in the short run pushes the refugees more in the labor market, pushes them to earn more. But two things you should notice. One, this effect is short run, it is a short uh, uh, lived. It's not that starting to work early, they stay in the labor market. They seems to uh, sli slide away. And second, the increase in income that they have because they work more is significantly smaller than the cut in welfare that they received. You see, it's about $2,000 for a cut of $6,000, which means that these refugees were significantly poorer. And in the paper that we write about that, we show that uh, there is some effect actually on, on uh, decreasing the outcome for their kids, increasing a little bit the probability of committing petty crime. So they're clearly not uh, um, sort of this policy of cutting welfare is not generating uh, an offsetting uh, increase in, uh, in wage earning. The red one, which is the, uh, the language, increasing by 300 hours of language, is the one which has the largest, the strongest, and the more persistent effect. In the long run, increases average income by $3,000. And the other two, although they are um, the, the size of the effect is smaller, this is just for being played, the black is being placed in a location with one standard deviation higher initial employment rate. And you see that that is actually significant and positive both in the short and in the long run. And this is about 600 extra dollar per year per standard deviation, which correspond if you are placed in a location in the bottom 25% versus top 75% of the employment rate in Denmark uh, correspond to a difference of about $1,500 per year, which is significant. The size of the network, which is the blue one, to the contrary, seems to have a small, relatively precisely uh, non-significant estimate effect. Yes. So just a tiny uh, technical question, which I, which I think is, is, is quite important here. Um, so the I mean, first of all, it, it's great, of course, that you, you um, evaluate all these um, in, in these different ways, but, but the kind of treatment effects you, you get out of these different identification strategies are quite different, right? So you have initial placement, which is more of an intention to treat effect. Um, you have these evaluations at cutoffs, which are, which are more like local treatment effects around these cutoff, cutoff values. So if you, if you then now um, interpret the magnitude of these effects, you, you should somehow take this into consideration, no? I'm, I'm just wondering. So, um, uh, okay, let's go one, one, one by one. Um, uh, the, uh, for, in, in the case of the language uh, uh, training, uh, that's also an intent to treat because you have uh, that these people qualify for these language classes, 
they don't necessarily take. So there is a um, uh, average treatment on the treated uh, uh, could be rescaled. Uh, and uh, you're right that uh, um, that uh, th the welfare um, benefits uh, it's uh, um, in principle uh, an intent to treat, but it is more mechanical. Uh, and the active labor market policy also. I would say that all the policies uh, really uh, are all having access to the policies. So they're all intent to treat uh, type of. Uh, while being exposed to the local, uh, um, maybe also. Um, so let me say why we do it this way. We do this way because we wanted to compare all these numbers with the corresponding papers that exist in the literature in order to have numbers that were matching. You're right that when you put this together, you realize that there are a lot of different things going on. And uh, um, uh, sort of we had this discussion last time we talked about if we wanted to uniform exactly uh, this to be all uh, intent to treat or to make them all intent to treat. Uh, and uh, as I said, in the policy, I think that you can interpret most of them as intent to treat because we use the, uh, the, the timing when the policy was available to people, but it's not that uh, people were forced that they could. And then we have to find an equivalent way to, to, to treat the initial employment rate and that and tra trans transferring it. So it is a little bit of a limitation and maybe it is a little bit comparing um, apple to orange in some of the thing, but the significance of each coefficient, I think, is relatively clear from the policy point of view. So the language means if you make available 300 extra hour of uh, language to people, on average, the people who have this possibility will get this. And then the, the treatment on the treated was a little bit harder because, again, we don't know exactly all who really did all these uh, hours. Um, and uh, I take your point. I think it's a good point. Uh, and uh, maybe in the next version, we will have a much uh, an intent to treat comparable effect across all of them. And do you find the network effect being insignificant, surprising or not? Uh, do you have any information on the co-workers in the places that they work, the, the, whether they have uh, co-nationals in their workplace rather than where they, they live, right? Yeah, so that's a very good point. I don't find it surprising at all because if you read carefully the literature on the network effects, um, and there are that's the literature that has the most paper, you're going to find that every single paper um, uh, kind of qualify the network characteristics that generate an effect in a slightly different way. L let me be clear. There are a bunch of papers that don't find the effect of the network at the city level, but then they say it's very important the quality of the network. If then you only look at uh, people who were employed, uh, people who have a high level of education and provide uh, some uh, information, maybe you find an effect. Other people look at how long the previous refugee have been there and they don't find an average effect, but they find an effect if you look at people who have been there, the, the share of people who have been there for a longer time. So my take is that the network effect, I think that the easy thing, the easier thing to do to implement in the policy is say, is it beneficial without knowing all the detail of each city and of each place, working place? Is it beneficial to place a refugee in a place where there are many other refugees of the same country? And I think the answer to this question from most of the paper that I see, if you just do that, and from this is that there doesn't seem to be evidence that this is particularly beneficial. If you know, and if you choose what for you is the good network, which clearly is much more complicated uh, um, to, to, to find, then maybe there are some benefits of being in a company that has more people from your country or in being a place where there are a lot of employed people. So I find all this refinement very interesting, very case specific, uh, and uh, um, providing actually in, uh, in qualification. But to me, I am comfortable in saying that both us and a lot of the literature I see uh, doesn't seem to find a straight local size of the network effect on the long-term impact. And so that, those network effects, do they look at the non-pecuniary effects of potentially of those networks in terms of um, better integration, right? In terms of um, So, I mean, there is massive evidence that the refugees and the immigrants themselves want to be in places where there are these networks. So uh, clearly there must be some uh, consumption benefit, uh, personal benefit from being there. Here I'm talking about uh, labor market outcomes uh, in terms of employment and earnings, which are one form of economic uh, integration. And on that, uh, 
um, I don't say that there, again, my reading of our results and the leader is that there is not much, but of course, in a more holistic evaluation in which you also look at, uh, um, are they happier? Are they better uh, connected with other people? Maybe um, there, is, uh, uh, there is an effect. Okay, so let me go to the next. Uh, and here, uh, so um, this is just a table that puts the number to the of picture that I showed you. Uh, and so I don't need to spend very much time on this. Um, I will use my last 10, 15, 12, 13, 10 minutes to then, uh, so let's go, let's see what the next slides uh, tell. Okay, so um, uh, let me focus on a couple of things of the effect that I find very interesting. So the first bullet point makes this effect that language training seems to be extremely effective and location with high employment rate. And in particular here, which is a high employment rate of immigrants in the location seems to be very important. Um, Cutting welfare is a short run effect, but not long run with a much smaller positive earning effect than the cut immigrant. And then uh, this uh, uh, matching refugees with, uh, with employ occupation in shortage seems to do well in the short run, but we don't know in the long run. So let's qualify a few of these effects from the heterogeneity point of view. And then let me tell you in two minutes uh, a little bit more about the mechanism that we think are interesting in this language uh, training uh, effect. So let's see the next. Uh, okay, let's see. So um, heterogeneity effect. So the next. Um, so here I show on the left and on the right the average effect uh, in uh, in this case only in the short run because of the policy of matching refugees. And uh, the first is a female versus male comparison. The second is uh, linguistically close and linguistically far, which in part correspond to European versus uh, Middle East and African. And the bottom is uh, people who are initially located in high employment place and low employment place. So as you see here, the active labor market policy don't seem to have a big uh, difference between men and women. If anything, male are helped a little bit more, uh, which makes sense because male are the one closer, more marginal to get the job and with a little push, they will uh, uh, do better. Uh, but the other two dimensions don't seem to differ very much. Next, for the other policy, this is welfare cut. I show the whole dynamics, the short, medium and long run for the two groups. So remember the, the, the cutting of earnings only had a positive effect in the first, in the short run, in the first left. And what you see is that that effect is also stronger for male. So welfare cut pushed the male earner to be in the labor market in the short run, but in the long run, there is no effect for any of the uh, group. So the heterogeneity, these two policy uh, seem to uh, work better for males uh, than for female, and they don't seem to have a big difference in a linguistically close versus linguistically far or initial position. The language one, which is the next, is interestingly a little bit different because in comparison men and women, uh, both seems to have long run effect. And in fact, the long run effect for female and male seems to be similar, if anything, uh, marginally larger for female. And then in the longer run, the positive effect are for the linguistically far, for the group which is more disadvantaged. And this makes sense. The linguistically far is the one who gains the most from better language integration. So this policy of language language not only seems to hit something, uh, this employment result in the long run, but also seem to help a little bit more the vulnerable group, uh, women and linguistically far, relative to the group, which is not. So this to us has to do with the need for the more vulnerable, vulnerable group to really build some skills, some general skill in order to be employable and to have earnings, rather than just be pushed by a short active labor market policy or by a welfare policy. And then the last uh, one is the one of uh, uh, being placed in stronger labor market. And even interestingly, uh, being placed in a stronger labor market, this is also a little bit stronger for men than for women in the long run, and a little bit uh, uh, stronger this uh, uh, in the longer run for linguistically far. So um, also this is an interesting uh, policy because it seems to also help. And if you think that uh, linguistically far are people who have uh, um, hard time to find a job, uh, places where the labor market is more active uh, seems to help them a little bit more. Um, so those overall, then let me skip maybe a couple. Let's go. So here we talk a little bit more about that next. 
initially, but let me go to the next one uh, into the language policy. Okay, so now for the language policy, I want to show you a couple of dynamics, which I think are very interesting. And we did it for other, uh, but here they come out uh, more clear. So let's go to the next, which are graph. So first of all, um, I told you of uh, the impact of uh, earnings and unemployment, but this is the full dynamic between treatment and control of how uh, the uh, treatment, so people who got more education accumulate more earnings or become uh, moved to jobs that pay more and uh, higher employment. So you notice two things. First of all, the earnings and employment continue to grow uh, in the year after uh, the, the, the language classes are in the first two years, and then they continue to grow quite a bit after that, as if uh, sort of, uh, as people are on the labor market, they find better employment and increase their earnings because of their language skill. Next, I say because of their language skill, because what we observe is that what drives this increase in wage is an improvement in type of jobs. So if you take an index for the complexity of the occupation that they do, where complexity is an index that is positively depending on cognitive type of skills and communication type of skills and negatively on manual, you see that a lot of that gain in wages comes from the fact that these people do more complex jobs. So now you should think of this the following way. It's not that these people go from being uh, farmers to be engineers. That increase is exactly the type of difference in complexity of job that there is between a janitor, somebody who does a cleaning job, and an assistant of the elderly, a person who uh, uh, who attend and older people who need to have more communication and a little bit more cognitive. Those are two jobs that I didn't choose randomly. They are two jobs that employ a lot of these refugees. And so giving them a little bit more education, you move them from doing a temporary job which has very little perspective like cleaning an office to a job which is assisting or healthcare aid worker which has more of a longer term perspective. And this explains a big chunk of that. The other graph on the right shows if these people who get extra language were more likely to get additional education, typically a technical degree in uh, Denmark. And it has a little bit of an odd uh, um, behavior because it's not super precise. But one thing that is clear is that the big effect seems to happen after year 13, 14. So keep in mind that that year was the year of the Great Recession in Europe. So for this, uh, this uh, um, reform is 1999. So that was the year 2011, 10, uh, 11, when there was the recession. So our interpretation is that these people with better language, they moved to jobs which were more complex. So during the recession, some of them may have lost the job and, and lost a little bit, but then they retrained or they used this to increase a little bit of their formal education. In the long run, they end up with 10 to 15 percent more higher probability of having gotten Danish education, education in Denmark. And so this will give them also this extra, um, extra uh, boost. Next. Two other things that we notice for the people who get this extra education. So they, that graph on the left, tell the probability of a refugee who's resettled in a place to move out of this place. They are more likely to stay in the short run. And this should be because to take advantage of the class of the language class, they need to stay. But in the long run, they're just as mobile as the other. Many refugees move to opportunity and go. And the right graph, sorry, there is not even a legend there, but shows that this effect is particularly strong. The square are people who initially are in rural area in the triangle in urban area. People who are in rural area initially tend to live right away to find better opportunity. But if they receive the language class, they stay a little bit longer and they have a little probability of staying local, uh, which implies that the language also will help them to integrate in the local uh, place because they receive this. And so it can have a boost also for the local um, community. Next. So um, then, uh, yeah, three minutes. Then we also looked, given that the language was so promising to us and we thought, well, we see that people do better job, have a higher employment, have a higher uh, probability of, um, of getting uh, upgrade. We wanted to see if it had also impact on other outcome of the children. So first we looked at a lot of outcome of the family. If we made this refugee more likely to marry a Danish person, to, to uh, have lower fertility, we don't find much there. But keep in mind that a lot of these refugees in terms of marriage arrived that they are already married uh, with somebody and then they reunify. So maybe that margin is not that important. But we wanted to see if this improved 
their children outcomes. So we choose children that are born also around the time in which uh, these parents are subject to the policy. And we split them between children who um, were very young when the parents access this language course and, these, uh, who, and those who were adolescent uh, in uh, that uh, period. And we look at the impact of the having a parent which is treated, uh, so has gone to the class, the impact on criminal behavior of the kids, so having property and violent crime, and on schooling, in particular completing secondary schooling and graduating from secondary schooling by age 18. And keep in mind that we cannot do much more past age 18 for the kids because for the timing, these kids um, you know, are at most 18 to 20 uh, who were born uh, in, uh, uh, in 1999, which is the time uh, of this reform. Okay, next. All right, so this, one minute. Okay. So then let me show the picture, the figure after that. Sure. Let, let me comment the figure and then it goes next, uh, which has more or less these results. Okay. So here I show the impact of uh, uh, the being treated on, uh, um, on the left, schooling outcome, and on the right, crime outcome of the kids. And I divide between boys and girls. So boys are the green, blue, and girls are the pink, uh, orange. And by uh, boys who were extremely young, so who were uh, born in the 96, 2001, uh, when the parents could access, and boys who were teenagers. So first of thing, you notice that all the effect on kids, which are positive on the probability of completing and taking final exam and negative on crime, all are on boys. Boys are the kids who are more kind of at risk in a sense because they graduate at lower rates and they have higher criminal uh, propensity. So the effect are most on, on the boys. But interestingly enough, the effect on education seems to be particularly strong on kids who were adolescent when the parents took the class, the green one, who were a little bit older. Those effects are strong. So in this case, we think that when the parents took the class and got a little bit better integrated, they maybe learn how to check the homework of these kids as well. And so give push them a little bit and this improved their schooling outcomes. To the contrary, the crime outcome seems to be stronger for the kids who were very little. So kids who grew up their whole life in, in how Household, which had a little bit more of language knowledge and integration. In fact, the blue uh, has the biggest negative impact. This is a very big negative impact uh, on crime. Uh, in fact, uh, that's the probability of having been charged uh, of a property crime or any crime by the by when you are 18. And this uh, probability is uh, for refugees is unfortunately relatively high, uh, but is about uh, you know 15 percent, and uh, that that effect. Uh, essentially eliminates uh, that uh, for that group of kids who had treated parents uh, since they were little kids. So next, then I think I have the conclusion. Sorry, I, I rushed a little bit uh, here, uh, but uh, I wanted to give the whole picture. So um, ultimately, this paper that does a little bit of the overall view uh, seems to say that uh, language training and initial placement in strong labor market are interesting and important policy. Some active labor market policies seems to have short run positive in impact and, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, we need to know more about the impact on the longer uh, run. Uh, and then uh, there seems to be evidence that welfare cut, although they push people on the labor market, have a short run effect and may have kind of unintended consequences because they drop the income of everybody. And in longer term, maybe the language integration effect uh, spill over onto the kids with better schooling and lower prevalence. And of course, if you do a cost benefit analysis that we do a little bit at the end of the paper, the fact that some of these advantages of the language um, policy, which is among the policies, not even very expensive, is like the, co the class of teaching these courses is not very large. We calculated in five years, it fully repays and it has effect on the next generation. So the present discounted value can be uh, really high. And so general skill, uh, language skill, uh, and some uh, access to high employment labor market, uh, maybe uh, combined with uh, active labor market policy seem to be a winning combination here, uh, looking at all the overall effect. And I'm gonna stop here. Thank you. Uh, five minutes for questions. Uh, do you wanna take the question? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I think we have a question online. Maybe, maybe we can take that one first. Hi, thank you very much. And thanks for this presentation. I have 
uh, no, no, no doubts. I mean, believe in this effect. Something that I was wondering, though, uh, is it possible that the, the the treatment effect from language courses is also capturing uh, another treatment effect, which is, for, in for instance, getting closer to local institutions or local public administration, which is something that might be potentially very interesting in countries where, uh, for instance, English speaking countries or French speaking countries where language is not so much an art though, because there are many uh, migration, I mean, countries where, you know, with net outward migration where this language languages are uh, broadly sp spoken and uh, we see it here in France. I mean, language is often uh, not necessarily conducive to better integration of, of migrants in the labor market. So perhaps this uh, alternative, uh, I mean, this uh, additional uh, treatment effect not directly channeled by language could be, could give a glimmer of hope to these countries. And uh, let me just add on this because I think you referred to a paper that had 300 hours of language training and yours has 400. Uh, I think you're referring to the French paper, yes. Grand in French, France, and what they find is it's not the language per se, but the network that they create one. So, yes. Uh, yes, so thank you for the question online, which is great, and, and Shem followed on that. So, um, um, absolutely, I would say. So let me say a couple of things to qualify what you said. I think that some of what you say uh, is there and could be a little hard to exactly separate. So number one, uh, also the Danish program had a little bit of an increase in civic education on top of just the language. And so we really evaluate a bundle of language plus this civic education, which, as you say, allowed people to understand better how to connect maybe with authority, how to connect uh, with the local, which is uh, quite important. Um, um, it's a little harder, uh, you know, also by doing these classes, you are together with people and you know some uh, uh, people, you uh, um, uh, extend your network. And I would say one thing. So we think that the effect that goes through that improvement of occupation and given that there is this clear signal that occupation where you use more language become more uh, prominent um, signal that just pure language uh, is something, is part of this effect, uh, right? Uh, um, the fact that you decide you can move to a, a, a job uh, where you use the language more intensively because you have taken that course seems to indicate that there is something to the pure value. But certainly, uh, there, there, given that there was also this extra education, and given that uh, um, in the end, this treatment is being in class with other people uh, and learning something else, really what we are evaluating is being in class with other people and learning language and something else. And I agree with you that a smart program uh, to teach language uh, or to um, should be a program of connecting refugees uh, with the better understanding the culture, the society where they are in with all the benefits of being in a class, generating the networks. And maybe in France of England, the pure language learning uh, will be a little bit less uh, relevant uh, and uh, the civic part will be more important. Thank you. Um, yeah, Michel, you can go ahead. I also have a question just in case we have time, but I think we have two more in the room. So one, two, and I'll keep mine for, for after. So thanks, Giovanni, for the very interesting presentation. Um, I was wondering, because you showed these effects in terms of occupational upgrading, after the intervention, did you also look at the firm dimension, if they moved to better firms, to less segregated firms? Uh, yes, that's a great question. So uh, we actually looked at uh, if they moved, uh, at if they move at better firm, but not in terms uh, of uh, less segregated in terms of the level of wage of other people in the firm. And so there is uh, 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 definitely, so for language, there is a movement towards better occupation in firms that on average pay higher wages. So the firm fixed effect improves. In this paper, we don't do, one could do much more because you're right that these are employer employee matched uh, firm. And so you really could look at the whole uh, dynamic of a person uh, in terms of not just what occupation they do, but where they are in what firms they are here. We only, we go, we do this because we want to see if this effect, and then we do this also for the effect of starting in a high employment uh, labor market. And that effect though, we don't find that people seems to get in better, uh, a higher wage because they are in better firms, but 
on average, because people who start in high employment labor market tend to stay in high employment labor market. And in the long run, this just gives them higher, better opportunity, even if they are not necessarily matched with higher quality firm. While for the language, we do find this higher probability of climbing up also the ranking uh, of firms. Yes. Maybe just as a follow up. So yes, so job mobility of the refugee does increase. Yes, if you're asking job mobility about the other people uh, of the rest of the people, who, yeah, yes, it does, it does. So, I mean, this uh, upgrading correspond to uh, higher mobility. Also, if you put a dummy for just, did you move out of your initial occupation, the probability increases. So it's uh, an upgrade joint with uh, a higher probability of moving out of your occupation. Yeah. So I guess I will take the last question. Um, and really quickly, uh, I really read through the paper. It was quite, it was dense and very interesting. Um, one of the things that you did talk about during this presentation, of course, is uh, the, the movers uh, and, and the, the people moving from the initial place. Uh, and then you presented something on rural and urban, which was not in the paper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, and, and what I wanted to know a little bit more. Okay, yes. Was, um, you know, you, you mentioned there's there may not be necessarily uh, what you mentioned seemed to indicate that there's no there's no real incentive for rural policymakers, for example, mm -hmm. to train, give language learning training classes in these areas mm -hmm. um, because they will move out. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So how do I tell that to people who want to know what to do? So sorry, this presentation really was a little bit of a combination of that paper and the two paper that we wrote and published on the original studies. So if you go to the to the one which is for coming and review economic and statistics, you will find that uh, chart. But yeah, so the question is, um, if you give language training to people um, and the pe people mm, mm, on the individual point of view are going to do better, but they are going to become more likely to move out also of the location where you are, what incentive do uh, rural uh, municipality to have that. So in that graph, I, we were showing that if you divide people between urban and rural, uh, first of all, these people will stay longer in the rural uh, location. And even in the longer run, they have a slightly lower out mobility. So giving them uh, this education and in a sense, um, linking them to the uh, to the initial location because they have to be there to take the class will make them more likely to stay in the longer run and so the idea is that uh, uh, although um, several of them will leave and so there will be some spillover uh, by this uh, sort of by increasing the skill and the in uh, the possibility probability of finding a good job uh, you will also increase the probability that they stay in the initial location in particular, if this location is rural. Um, you could, what you can say to a rural em, uh, employee? Well, you can say two things. One is that this is the effect, that there is a more higher probability that they stay. Second is that the type of jobs that I am talking about are type of jobs that are, there are a ton of, there are these simple service jobs that, you know, they are also present in uh, non-urban community. As I said, these are not people that become STEM engineers. Um, these are people that uh, become better at, uh, you know, maybe working in interacting with uh, the public, uh, in assisting people, in uh, working in an intermediate qualified healthcare type of job in an hospital. So I think there would be an increasing demand for this type of worker in the rural areas. Number one, the refugees are very good candidates. Number two, is going to be a way easier, although you lose some of them, to keep a refugee there than to attract a native to do a job uh, there. And uh, um, in the longer run, I think, uh, uh, number three, um, I think you're going to help in particular women uh, doing this. And so that's if uh, at the local level you are sensitive to also have a better, smaller wage gap and all these things, I think that will be a way of uh, telling them that this is a natural way to improve the quality of life of uh, refugee women, uh, giving them some local opportunities.